This week we have been truly blessed by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is nothing compared to what it will be someday, but it is the first drops of the loud, uh, of the latter rain that will result eventually in a loud cry. Drops are falling. They have been falling for a long time. In Sister White's time, she said the first drops were falling already. What has kept back the fullness of the outpouring except our hard hearts? Our ignorance, lack of knowledge, lack of commitment have held back God's great outpouring. And we pray that that will soon end. We pray that God will soon be able to do what he's always dreamed of doing, empowering his people, totally committed, empowering them to put an end to the sin and suffering. Through his power, he can bring sin to an end if we will allow him. I have been told by several of you that yesterday's presentation brought tears to your eyes. And I believe that when God demonstrates his power to solve problems, truly he will do it for anybody. God doesn't have favorites. And yet, we make it so difficult for God. His heart must break when he dreams of doing much more for us than we allow him to do. And he can only use us in proportion to our commitment to what he to what he is able to do with us. It depends on our decision, not his. So, will you bow your heads with me as we ask God to do this for us? Heavenly Father, we are here in your presence. You can see and read all our thoughts. You can see the condition of our heart. It needs surgery. Even though we have much, much evidence of your care, we are witnesses of your protection throughout our life and, our, and your blessing. We have been slow to acknowledge, slow to follow, slow to listen. But we pray that this weekend will put an end to that and that in our hearts we will make a commitment to daily surrender everything take out of our hearts, take out of our minds, clean our lives of any worldliness that we may truly be separated from the world and be totally under your control. That is what we pray for. That is what we dream for. And, and Lord, you would never turn us down. So we thank you for hearing us. We thank you for answering our prayer. Give us this gift today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite verses in, in the Bible is Isaiah 30, 21. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the left and when you turn to the right, or to the right and to the left. There's another verse that's also one of my favorites, and that is in similar. That can be found in, in Psalm 32. I have a little card in German here. I won't read it in German to you. Some of you probably understand German, but it's a, it's a beautiful gift somebody gave me, and it's one of my favorite Bible verses. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. A little child looks to his parents, and, it, and, the, and the parent says, or, and the child knows very well what that means because you can instruct your children with your eyes if they are watching your face but what happens if you're not watching what happens if you're not listening or you have too much loud noise so you can't hear God's still small voice saying turn to the left turn to the right you see we have a problem with not listening because we have other we have attention deficit disorder, self-imposed 
disorder. The attention deficit is only toward God because we have plenty of attention for other things. There was a time that God stopped and he tried to reason with Israel. Sometimes he could not reason, sometimes he tried. And his, through his prophets, he would say, come, let us reason together. Think. Analyze. From this day, when you start to build Jerusalem, when you start to build my temple, look and see if I do not pour out blessings. And he says, the day and the month. And from that time forward, see what happens, because you made my house first. God loves for us to stop and reason. And in Isaiah 5, verse 3 and 4, verse 5 also, it says, And now, O in inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. Stop and analyze. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? When I looked for grapes, I found wild grapes. And go now. I will tell you what I, I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain not upon it. What more could God have done to his remnant people? Bless them with the spirit of prophecy. Bless them with the health message. I say them, but really it's us. He has blessed us with so much knowledge, so much, so much enlightenment of understanding of prophecy. My wife and I were going through the airport uh, in Bolivia, the international airport in Santa Cruz, and this man and his wife stopped us and said, we, my wife and I are pastors of one of the largest evangelical churches. He said, we just wanted to thank you for your television network. We listen to your pastors. We know that Adventists are the only ones that understand prophecy. And then we preach those sermons again on Sunday. <laughs> People are watching. People need answers. They know that that something is about to happen and Seventh-day Adventists have answers but we're embarrassed of our own message. We try to avoid appearing as Seventh-day Adventists. We try not to expose what we really are, a remnant people of God. We want to be like them and they're looking for the information that we have. Adventists are the only ones that know prophecy, that understand prophecy because of why? The spirit of prophecy. God has blessed us like no other church with the spirit of prophecy except Israel of old. All the prophets. I was in the Philippines. I was speaking in, I've spoken in all the universities, all the major, I guess there's three, every union has a university. I've spoken in all of them. But I was speaking in the central Philippine Adventist college uh, they asked me to speak to all of the school, the, all the theology class. All the students were there. The teachers were there. And one of the students said, Uncle David, you have referred to the spirit of prophecy as being God's word. But even Sister White herself said that she was a lesser light, that the Bible was the greater light. So why do you refer to it as being equal? I said, well, which of the, which, now that you are studying theology, tell me which of the prophets consider themselves a greater light. Maybe Moses, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Certainly, one of them would have considered themselves a greater light. The answer is, all of the prophets were minor lights. It's only when you put them all together, all the lesser lights together, that you have the greater light. The accumulation of revealed truth makes the greater light. 
And Sister White was not any different than any of the other prophets. The same Gabriel that talked to Daniel spoke to Sister White. The same Jesus that spoke to John the Revelator spoke to her too. She was a lesser light because she was a, one of the many messengers that God has sent over the history of the world to bring us the light. What does light mean? It means truth. And who is truth? God. Where does light come from? The father of lights. And all that is revealed from the father of lights has the same value. It comes from the same origin. So I said, that's why I consider the spirit of prophecy to have the same validity. It has a different function. It is not so much to establish doctrine as, as previous revealed light. It is to prepare this last generation for our mission and to protect us from the deceptions that are coming upon the world. The South American Division released a testimony last year of a retired Brazilian Adventist pastor. And it was shown in all the churches. This pastor, when he was a young man, was a coal porter like many young people have been over the years. And he went to sell books and he saw a big cathedral and next to it was, was a monastery. And he went to knock on the door and said, maybe, maybe some of the Catholic priests would like to buy some of my books. So he knocked on the door. A priest came out and he said, sir, I, I'm selling books. I was wondering if you might be interested. Well, what do you have, young man? And he looked through the books and he goes, that book, that, that great controversy you have there. I know that book. I have it. Let me show you. And he went in and came out and he showed him how it was underlined, all the pages. And he said, we've read it. We all believe in that. We believe Ellen G. White is a prophet of God. And we believe that when a crisis comes, we want to teach all our church members to stand on truth and stand to the last great crisis. Well, the young man was completely surprised. So he said, so, so that means you know that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the true church. Oh, no, 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 not, hold it. I said Ellen G. White was a prophet of God. I don't know if the Seventh-day Adventist church is the true church or not because they don't even believe in Ellen G. White. They don't keep what's written in this book. I have a, a, a friend who worked for years with Mother Teresa. Young. He was young, African man. He worked for four years in India with Mother Teresa. He never told her he was an Adventist. But she found out one day. And so she called him and said, why in the world did you hide it from me that you were a Seventh-day Adventist? And he said, well, I, I, was, I was thinking maybe you wouldn't let me work with you because I like working with you. I like caring for the sick and the poor. I like the work that you do. I believe it's of God. But, but I thought maybe you wouldn't let me. She said, let me show you what I have. She pulled out of her pocket, Ministry of Healing. And she said, I want you to know that everything I do in my ministry comes from this book. And I'd like to know why you Adventists don't believe in it. Indicted. We have not been good, faithful ambassadors. So other people believe in the spirit of prophecy more than most of us do. Because they can tell when they see light. They can tell what comes from God. If you're, like Romans 8 says, if you are led by the spirit of God, you are a son of God. And God has sons, millions of them, sons and daughters in other, other churches. And they're listening to his voice and they're following. All they need is a conviction of God and they will follow. The problem is, where does God take them? To the Seventh-day Adventist church so they can turn around and leave again? And say, I had more than I found there. It's dangerous for God to bring somebody to the Adventist church today. Only a few people that come choose to stay. God doesn't want to destroy his other children, so he's waiting until he has a people ready that, can, that are ready to reflect his character so that they can come in. He's not ready to bring them in yet. They won't have a problem with the Sabbath. As soon as they're convicted of it, they will follow. 
But he's waiting for a people that can be his ambassadors. When I was speaking in the Philippines, I met a, an Adventist pastor who just also happened to be the ambassador for the country of the Philippines, Pastor Tejano. He was a union department director when the government called him and asked him, please, to serve as an ambassador. The union said, this is quite an honor. By all means, accept the call. So he went to the Philippines. And he and I have preached on various occasions in different places. We, I stay sometimes at his house when, uh, in, a, in Manila when I happen to go through. I, I haven't been going lately to the Asia. I just, I'm just i running out of time. I don't have as much time as I used to. I decided to spend more time in South and Central America and the Caribbean because it was my backyard. And I'm spending more time in other continents than in my own backyard. So I decided to, to spend more time there and open up all the countries. This last year, we have projects running in every single country of South America. Now the goal is Central America. And the Caribbean has a few islands, beautiful pearls in the ocean, Caribbean ocean that need to need to need some attention as well. But he told me, he invited me to go with him to to visit the president of the country. And he put me in his car and I started to get up front. He goes, no, 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 no. VIPs sit in the back. The chauffeur sits up front. And you're my invited guest. So you sit in the back with me. I'm learning protocol. I don't know how this works. So I sat in the back. And as we came, he said, you know, when I, he said, I'll share some stories about when I was a young man. But I came to the same palace when I was a young man. But right now, see what happens. So as we came up to the gate, the, the, the guard looked in, and the chauffeur said, Ambassador Tejano, po! All the Filipinos know what that means. It means, it's a, when you say po, it's a matter of respect, formal. If you say Uncle David, you don't have to say po. <laughs> but if you say Pastor David, Pastor, you say po. Because it's more formal. Dear sir, po. So, Ambassador Tejano, po! He said, see that? No problem. Then we got to the gate. And as we got there, Ambassador Tejano, po! The gate opened up and right into the presidential palace. He said, it's easy to get in here when you're an ambassador. They treat you different. We found out the president was on a trip, but the first, the first uh, gentleman was there, the president's husband. Because you see, the Philippines had a lady president. So we got to speak with the first gentleman. And he showed me around and, uh, and I, I saw all these military going through there. They, do, they looked like Filipinos, but one of them had a name tag that said Austria. So I immediately went up to him and shook his hand and he was surprised to see me and I said, Sind Sie aus Österreich? Kann ich mit dir Deutsch sprechen? What are you saying? I thought you were from Austria. No, that's my name. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I thought I met somebody from Austria that I could speak German with. With whom I could speak German. So we went and we saw, uh, we saw the. Uh, uh, the first lady, Emilda, when she was uh, Marcos, her, the collection of shoes, you know, she's famous for her shoes. We saw some of the things, he showed me around. But he said, I want to impress on your mind one thing. When you're an ambassador, you have no right to express your personal opinion. You may only communicate that which is given to you to communicate. So when somebody goes to the... Uh, uh, in New Zealand, and right now he's in Papua New Guinea, but if somebody goes there to the embassy and says, we want to know what the official position of the government is on this, on this particular thing. He calls the government, the president, the president says, this is our position. Boom. He comes back, the position of the government, and he may only state that which was told him to state. No ambassador will ever say, in my opinion, never. And we're all ambassadors. 
we are not allowed to do anything but communicate the message that has been given to us. And why are Seventh-day Adventists preaching a strange message and with strange fire? All around the world, we're preaching evangelical messages, Catholic messages. That's because they are not ambassadors. Ambassadors never do that. If you want to know who an ambassador is, it's those who faithfully communicate the message God has given them. I never will forget what he told me, and he told me the story when he went there to New Zealand. All ambassadors are required to give in their credentials, hand over his credentials, so he had an envelope. He gave it to the prime minister. All the other ambassadors from all the other countries were present. They all, of course, we welcome Ambassador Tejano to, from Philippines to New Zealand. Everybody clapped. And then he said something that stunned everybody. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I am not only an ambassador for the Philippines. You mean you're an ambassador for more than one country? He said, I'm an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister, and as such, I'm an ambassador for the King of Heaven. I would like to ask God's blessing on you, sir. And it, by all means, please. He said, please kneel down. And he knelt down in front of all the ambassadors, and he put his hands on the prime minister and prayed for him. Do you think Pastor Tejano understands what it's like to be an ambassador? For God. His greatest calling is to be an ambassador for God, and his second calling is to be an ambassador for his country. All of us have been called to be ambassadors. We are to speak for the king everywhere we go. And you know, there's a way you dress if you're an ambassador. You don't dress carelessly. You don't call attention to your own body. Men, women. Come on. There are protocols to follow. If you're an ambassador, you can dishonor your country if you dress wrong. You dress like the world, the king of the universe is embarrassed. It's better not to be an ambassador than to claim to be an ambassador and to embarrass the king. That's why those who mix hot and cold and are lukewarm will be spewn out of his mouth. They do more damage to the kingdom than if you were cold, than to say you're a representative and misrepresent his government. So God has called us to get instructions. In order to listen carefully, you have to put aside the noise of the world. You can't hear God's instructions if you have movies and novels and other things ringing through your head and music from the world. You can't hear his voice. So how are you going to be an ambassador if you can't hear the voice of God telling you what to do? You have to keep your mind clean, your body clean. Now, we're all struggling with how to do that, of course. The sermon this morning brings to in focus very, very clearly that we all have room for improvement. My wife and I travel all over the world and we stay with people everywhere and I would, I would really be grateful if I could just stay at home all the time and I could control everything about what I eat, what I drink and everything because it would be really nice if I could just follow the same routine and have the, the right thing. But we stay in people's houses and we eat food from all over the place and it's not something you can always control. But that's where we say to God, Lord, you please protect me. We do the best we can and our best is not perfect, but we try and we ask God to make it perfect and someday he will. Someday he will show us how to do that. But as long as I keep staying in a different bed each night, in a different house each day, and eating a different diet every day, and sleeping at different times, one time zone and another time. All the speakers that travel, Pastor Jeremiah knows very well, he and I partner, and I partner with others, and we work all together as one team. We're all on the same team. That's why we're here together today. That's why we enjoy working together. We're all ambassadors, some in the Philippines, some in South America, some in Europe, some in the United States, some in Canada, some in our community, some in Georgia, some in Alabama, some in California. Wherever you are that God has called you, 
You are to be an ambassador to represent the king in your behavior, your dress, your actions, your words, your entertainment, everything should be according to the standards that the king has. God has given the Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist Church special privileges, and if we follow, great blessing follows. I'm going to tell you the story of two hospitals. One is in Guam, and one was in Tennessee. Two Adventist hospitals. I was asked to have camp meeting in Guam. That's a, a little U.S. island on the other side of the world. It used to belong to the, to the division over there, but because of the connection with the U.S., they finally, it's part of the North American division. So the North American division uh, administrators frequently fly to the other side of the world and are still in the North American division. But being a U.S. territory, I was invited to go there and for camp meeting, and I mentioned some of my hospital experience as a hospital administrator when I was young, when I was hijacked and, uh, in Mexico. And the hospital administrator said, would you be willing to speak to the, the administration and the medical staff, the chief uh, medical directors and uh, department directors, would you be willing to speak to us and give us some ideas of how we can do mission and how we can improve the, the financial uh, status of our, uh, our current financial status? I said, sure. So we had about 20 persons there. I talked a little bit about my experience, but I, I, I asked him a question. I said, are you having trouble getting medical staff over here? Yes. We have trouble because we advertise. We put it in all the union papers and publications in North America. We tell them we will pay them a good salary. We tell them they will be comfortable. We tell them that we will take care of them. And the young people that graduate from medical school, they just hardly want to come here. I said, you're misreading the young people today. If you want money and comfort, you don't go to Guam. You stay in the States. Why would you go to Guam to find comfort and money? Don't appeal to that. Tell them, this is a missionary post. It will not be comfortable. You will be expected to go on boats and airplanes to the islands to do evangelistic work. You will have to sacrifice, and you don't get paid what you're worth, but you will be paid sufficient to live. I said, now you're going to find warriors willing to come and work for you. You're appealing to the comfort. Don't appeal to those groups. And you know what? They changed their strategy. A year later, I was speaking there again, and they said they got a whole batch of physicians willing to experience hardship for God. But then I said, what about the finances? We've been operating in the red for years. I said, I, don't, I have a question for you. If something were to happen to your hospital, or if, if, if some government policy or some thing were to uh, cause you to have to close, how many of your neighbors would cry and defend, would cry, and how many would fight to defend you? I don't know if anybody would. Now, how many free days of medical, how much free medical care do you give away? None. I said, if you want the loyalty of your neighbors, make one day free OBGYN. Some day, one day make it free internal medicine. Another day, free radiology. Just, just give some free care on certain days and people who qualify or people who can come in, those who normally can't afford it, take care of your people and they will take care of you. They won't let anybody close you down as long as you're a vital part of their life. They did it. And the next year, for the first time in many years, they were in the black. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. The more you give, the more you receive. That's the law of heaven. That's, a law, that's like the law of gravity. Even, even atheists and agnostics who give, receive too. Because it's a law. I mean, 
if I jump out, if a godly person jumps out of an airplane with a parachute and an ungodly person jumps out with a parachute, the same thing happens to both. Because it's a law that God established that it applies to everybody in the universe, right? Given, it shall be given unto you. So some of us say, well, we just don't have enough. Ha, ah, that's your problem. You're not giving enough. You can write your own paycheck. The more generous you are, the more generous God is. You think you can be more generous than God? You think God's going to allow you to be more generous than him? Like, oh my, Gabriel, we have to do something. Those people in that church are so generous, we're going to be embarrassed one of these days. God would never allow that to happen because God has the most generous heart of everybody. So if you give, he will naturally honor his law, universal law of generosity. I don't know how to put it in math, but I'll tell you what, it works. Even if you don't have, take the widow with two mites. I'm sure that when she gave her last, without even knowing the rest of the story, someday we'll find out in heaven that God immediately gave it back to her. It's happened to us so many times, we don't know how to explain. Give, even if you give your last penny, just give to God's work as you see a need to your neighbor, as you see somebody has a need, just give and it will be given back to you. So you can accumulate? No, so you can give again. What God is looking for is funnels. Funnels that can receive and pass it on. Just, of course, a funnel sometimes is so restricted that even if you pour it too fast, it can't go out the bottom. But if you have a big funnel, the faster you give out the bottom, the faster you can pour it in the top. That's what God is looking for. And so the story of Guam, until the last time I went there some years ago, was that they implemented those changes. They began to give away services. They began to really appeal to mission-driven young people, and they found that God met their needs. Now let me tell you a story of another hospital. This was in the story of the Adventist hospital that used to be an Adventist hospital in Jellicoe, Tennessee. The hospital administrator asked me to come and have a week of prayer. I went to that hospital, had the week of prayer at the church on Sabbath, at the hospital during the, during the week. Uh, all the personnel was invited in the mornings. I spoke with all of them. And, and then the hospital administrator asked me, what, what would be your suggestions to make us more mission-driven? What can we do in our hospital to make, us, to make us more effective in mission? I said, let's walk to the hospital, and I'll, I'll tell you. As I looked around, I looked at all the walls, and I said, how do I know this is a Christian hospital? What do you mean? Well, if it was a Buddhist hospital, you would find Buddhas and Buddha saints all over the walls. Where are Christ's saints? Where are the memory verses? I said, if this is a Christian hospital, you ought to have Christ's saints in strategic places. So that when people walk through, they go, oh, Peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I, I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. <laughs> I'm going to surgery right now, and I'm so glad I read that memory verse. Hmm? And I said, do, you, do all your staff pray with the patients? I don't know. Well, teach them how to pray with the patients. In every department. Teach them to pray. Teach them to pray. He said, okay. And I said, uh, by the way, the medical director, the director of nurses, and the hospital administrator need to get together in the chapel every morning, take the list of patients, and pray for all your patients. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Take me to the, take me to the room in the back where you control the cable TV. I saw a big rack there, and I said, let me look at all the channels you got. Satan's channel, Satan's channel, Satan's channel. There's a good one, Satan's channel, Satan. Bad, bad, next one. I said, you mean you bring patients to your hospital, and they're on the point of dying, they're going to surgery, and at that moment, Satan has access to their minds in an Adventist hospital. Why would you even allow Satan in this building? Get rid of all those channels. You can put on, there's a lot of evangelical people in your community, so put on some evangelical stations so that their churches and their pastors, can, but only godly material. Definitely no movie channels. 
Definitely no worldly channels. Don't give the devil a chance to get his foot in here. And you know what? He implemented all of that. But there's one other thing. Take me to the accounting department. I asked the accountant, do you charge your patients before they get service or afterward? Well, before we can do anything for them, they have to make financial arrangements. I bet your community really loves you, don't they? <laughs> Not necessarily. Neither would I. You're not here to serve them, you're here to make money. If you want to show them that you want to serve them, you take care of their needs first, and then they can make financial arrangements. Show them that they're more important than the money. And then you're going to see a difference. He implemented that one too. He called me a year later and he said, the auditor is coming next week, and we're $1 million in the red. He said, we've never been in the red before. We've always survived, but this time we're in really deep trouble. What do we do? I said, that's God's problem. You want to pray together? We prayed together. He called me three days later and says, we just got a surprise check from the U.S. government for $1 million. They said, we made a mistake, and here's the difference. The next year, the same problem. Two weeks before, he called me. We're in trouble again. He got another million dollar check for a different reason, and they were in the black. He said, this is incredible. God is protecting us. He's providing for us. I said, and you're advancing his mission. It is important to God to take care of you because you're helping him finish the mission. And then one day my wife said, David, I got a problem. I got a hernia, a left inguinal hernia. I can hardly walk and it's very painful. I said, let me call my Adventist hospital friends. See, what, see if they have a special plan for missionaries. <laughs> so I called them and I said, by any chance, I said, my wife has a left inguinal hernia and, and I don't know if there is a way that you can give us a special plan because we work in the jungles. We don't have insurance, but, but uh, we, can't, we, we couldn't afford to operate in the States on normal prices. We would have to go to Bolivia and do it there or do it in a third world country, but it, the safety wouldn't be the same. He said, let me talk to our chief surgeon. He knows you very well. So he talked to the chief surgeon, and he'd been a missionary doctor before, and he said, me? Charge David Gates? What would God do to me? <laughs> I will do the surgery for free. And the, and the hospital administrator said, the hospital will also give it to you for free. Just bring your wife. So I brought my wife up to the hospital, thanking the Lord for the, such a wonderful blessing. And, and they came to take her blood, and they prayed with her. And then they took her to x-ray, and they prayed with her. And I noticed they're going in the elevator, going up, and, and another elevator going down. There were Bible verses inside and outside the elevator. In all the rooms, in the lab, everywhere you could see Bible verses that drew your attention to Jesus. His promises, his words were everywhere. And he said, he, said, he told me, the administrator told me, we have a very good Baptist member here, and I asked him to do it, and he was the one that chose everything, and he put it up everywhere. And then, finally, it was the doctor's turn to come. He said, David, <laughs> I went to, I've never done this before. He said, but uh, I've already scheduled the surgery. Your wife is here. They've already done the lab work. They've done everything. She's ready to go to surgery. And I haven't even seen her yet to know if the diagnosis is correct. I just took your word for it. I need to check and make sure that your diagnosis is correct. <laughs> he checked her and he said, yes, it is a correct diagnosis. So she can go to surgery. And, and uh, while she was in surgery, I went to the chapel. There was a hospital administrator, the chief medical director, and the nursing director, and they were praying for the whole list of patients. It was one of what I consider to be one of the most beautiful revivals in an Adventist hospital I have ever seen. But it didn't last long. Six months later, he called me and he said, 
Adventist Health Systems does not agree with the changes I've made. They're removing me out of the Adventist Health System. And they're placing somebody as administrator that doesn't even go to church. Within a year, it was no longer an Adventist hospital. It was sold. We have sold a lot of hospitals to the Catholic Church. I don't know who they sold Jellico to, but, but we have sold many. We have joined. We have done joint programs, and eventually it just becomes their hospital. You're a nurse. You're a health professional working at an Adventist hospital, and one day you're told you're no, long, no longer working for the Adventist church. You're now working for the Catholic church. What else can God do to his people? He went to look for grapes, and he found wild grapes. He went to look for a health message, and he found a worldly program, a money-making program, a secular program. When I was in Australia, one of the big blessings that God has given Australia was the health message there, and there is a very, very, very large Adventist hospital, Sydney Adventist Hospital. But when I was there preaching across from the division in the big church there, the pastor told me, my wife works in that hospital. No nurses are allowed to pray with the patients. Only the chaplain is allowed to pray. And recently he announced that he's not going to pray with anybody either because he wants to protect their religious freedom. Excuse me. It's an Adventist hospital. If somebody comes to the Adventist hospital, they should be able to find God. They know where they're going. When I came the next year to speak there, the, ha the pastor told me, my wife used to work there. Now she's my ex-wife. She left me. The influence was not very good. And the bookstore downstairs, who used to sell beautiful things, the lady in charge of the bookstore came and talked to me. She said, I want to tell you a beautiful story. I have always been selling beautiful things and books and encouragements and Bibles and praying with people. And one day I was told I had to carry all kinds of Catholic materials. I had to carry crucifixes. And I had to carry statues of Mary. Every day I would take them out of the window and hide them. And then the, the administration would come and put them back in the window again. And then they decided, they're going to close this down. And then I got a phone call. I got a call, phone call from the Adventist Review. They said, we have heard some of the testimonies you've had, and we would like to do an interview with you. They knew nothing about this problem. They interviewed her, and lo and behold, she shows up on the front page of the Adventist Review. And now the hospital administration can't close it. Because when, you, when you're on the front page of the Adventist Review, telling all the beautiful stories of how you reach people for Christ, and suddenly the administration closes it down, it would be an embarrassment. So they had to leave it open. But they were so upset. But she said, God has protected the work. I'm still going forward. But every day I remove the Catholic stuff and every day they put it back. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is a warfare. The devil hates the health message. And he would seek to destroy us in our confidence. What else can God do that he hasn't done? I want to share... I've only done this one time before, last week in Holland. I want to share some things with you. And I've never done it in public before until I did it last week. But we have to know how close we are to our decision being sealed forever. This is not a time to play games. I want to first tell you what biblical principles I'm going to establish us on when I tell you this story. I don't do it dogmatically. I don't do it trying to teach anything new as far as beliefs. I'm just telling you my experience and how it's changed my life, and I hope it will help you to realize the urgency of the times. First of all, I believe, like 1 Corinthians 10 says, 
Penny Levin, that everything in the past is an example for us who live in this last generation. We can look at the past and we can read history. I mean, we can read the future because we're going to be repeating it and we are repeating it. We are, we are repeating exactly the same mistakes of Israel. So if you want to know what's going to happen in the future, look back and you will find that it's being repeated right now. And we have to learn. If you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to repeat it. I also believe there's a limit to God's grace. Noah, for 120 years, preached a redeeming message, a message of hope, of salvation. Nobody can tell me that Noah only had three sons as his only family relatives. He must have had brothers and sisters. He must have had aunts and uncles. He must have had nieces and nephews, especially when you live 500 years. He probably had a large family. Not a single one of them joined him on the ark. Even the workers that were on the ark did not go in. They worked on the ark. They helped to build it, but they did not go in. God gave him his three sons and their wives and his own wife as a reward for his faithfulness. But the day came when he was told to enter the ark and the door was shut. Never to be opened again until God gave permission. God does extend his grace, but there is an end to that time. God recognizes the decisions of nations like the Amalekites. Judgment time was not yet. Their cup is not full. But the day comes when he says the limit has been reached. I believe organizations as well as countries have limits. The devil knows that. The devil knows that one of the things that caused the destruction of the world through the flood was the amalgamation of man and beast. It's been happening in secret for years. I could tell you story after story. People have told me, soldiers that have given their testimony of what's been happening and hiding in military hospitals. You won't sleep tonight if I told you. But since last, the year before last, the Pope stated that it's a good thing to mix the genes of animals with humans. Ever since then, the U.S. Congress has approved public funding for experimentation of mixing animal and human genes. The devil is trying to push every button he can to get God to, call, to stop. I can't take it any longer. And that way, abort God's plan to prepare a people. We're not dealing with a long preparation time, brothers and sisters. We're right, right, right at the end. I believe that in Amos 3, 7, what God, what it says is God will do nothing without first revealing it to his servants and prophets. I believe God would never act without first letting his people know. I also believe that he will pour out his spirit. In Joel 2, he says he will pour out his spirit. There will be dreams and visions and God will do much beautiful work with the consecrated people at the end of time, and he's been doing it already. If you've ever read the book, The Man That Could Not Be Killed. Have you, some of you read that book? About a, one hand. You need to read it. A, a, a brother that was imprisoned for a very long time. And his wife, who was not an Adventist, sat up in her bed and prophesied and told him what was about to happen and told him to expect it but to stand firm that God would protect them. And she died shortly after. She was never a Christian. Saul prophesied when the Holy Spirit was poured out. God gets to choose how he communicates with his people. It's not only for doctrine and belief, you have to know that it's written. Sola Scriptura is still solid. If you're a Protestant, you have to base everything you believe on God's word. There's hardly any Protestants today in the world. 
They will take whatever the pastors, whatever the priests, whatever the leaders say, and without a firm, thus sayest the Lord, what you believe. But you know, God speaks to you directly in many ways. Through prayer, through Bible study, through hearing his words say, turn left, turn right. With his eyes, if you're watching his face, he will say. But you have to be watching. Visions and dreams are also part of it. Did you know that in the Muslim world, God is pouring out his spirit and many, many Muslims are receiving direct revelations by dreams of what Jesus Christ is. It's overwhelming. God is working overtly with his children in other, in other areas of the world and other belief systems, guiding them. 1 Peter 4.17 says that the time is coming that the judgment must begin at the house of God. God is looking at us more closely than he, the time will come for the rest of the world. But he's looking at us today and he's knowing today is the shaking time. Today we are making permanent decisions. Someday soon, it, when our name comes up, it will be registered as a permanent, unchangeable decision. But we are living in a day, anti-typical day of atonement, and that is judgment day. And it's, what does the first angel's message say? Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment is come. We are living in judgment day. We cannot play games. And he's going to start with his own people. And according to Ezekiel, he's going to start with the ancients at the house of God. I believe that God always acts according to his calendar. And a proper understanding of the sanctuary will help you to understand and you will see that he's always acted in accordance to his calendar. When Jesus died, it wasn't just on any random day. He died exactly on the calendar, on the Passover. He was the Lamb of God. He was resurrected as the first fruits. He went to heaven and he was inaugurated into his position as our priest. He was inaugurated exactly on Pentecost. And as the oil ran off the beard of, of Aaron, the drops went down to earth and all his disciples received of that Holy Spirit in the early reign. He acts according to the calendar. The Seventh-day Adventist message was born because of that calendar. October 22, 1844 was not a random day. It's on the calendar. And of all people on earth, Adventists should understand the sanctuary. We should understand that God acts according to that plan. If you want to find out what's going to happen in the future, understand the sanctuary. How should we behave? What should we eat? What is the message? It's according to the sanctuary. When will Jesus come? What time of the year? He will come in the fall. Because according to the sanctuary service, that's after the judgment, then there, there's a feast of tabernacles. When there is persecution, somebody said, it's not only persecution, Uncle David. When we go to heaven, we're going to be, we're going to be traveling for seven days in temporary housing. And when we get to the New Jerusalem, it'll be on the eighth day, we're having a great feast. Oh, well, there's multiple ways to see how God's going to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles. If you want to understand what God is doing, you have to keep your eyes on the sanctuary. You have to understand the feast. You have to understand the dates. You have to understand the process because he acts according to his plan. I would not be surprised. There's no way for me to say it's going to happen, but I would not be surprised that the latter rain in its fullness will be poured out on Pentecost. Again. I can't say I have to wait, but every time it's Pentecost, I pay special attention that I'm ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And every time a day of a, a 10 days before the Day of Atonement comes, I prepare my heart. What if my name comes up? I, I, I preached a sermon similar to this in my home church in Marion, Illinois. And one of the, one, one of my parents, my dad is a head elder there, a retired pastor. And one of the members came and said, David, I didn't understand, but this week I was chopping wood and suddenly a voice spoke to me. I was out by myself on the farm and a voice spoke to me from heaven. There was nobody around, but a voice said, get your life ready 
your name is about to come up. I thought, maybe I'm going to die. No, he didn't say your number is about to come up. <laughs> That's what we say in English, right? Your number is going to come up. No, your name is about to come up. Get your life ready. And I didn't know what that meant until I heard the sermon today. Brother and sister, we better keep our life ready. We're living in a day of atonement when our lives cannot be anything but ready every single day. These are the principles that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Based on these principles, I believe, I believe God is specifically intervening in some people's lives so that they can get ready and their experience can help us to get ready. I was in Brazil last year in, near Sao Paulo at our, at our television network. I was meeting with all the teams. We went to church in the morning and then in the afternoon we had a meeting with all of our personnel and volunteers and those who do recording. There were several pastors there. They come and record at our TV network. For those of you that speak Portuguese, uh, uh, the, the name of the network, you probably know it is Terceiro Anjo, which means the Third Angel Network. TerceiroAngel.com.org as well. And Third Angel. And, and we're trying to give this message. And we all met together. And one of, our, one of our producers came and said, do you mind if I tell my story? And so Marco stepped forward. And he said, just a few months ago, I had a dream, a vision. I don't know how to say but it was so real like, like if we were here today. It wasn't just a dream that kind of you forget about it in the morning. It, was, it happened to me. And I was walking along a path with five or six people wide, a long line. And as we got closer, we could see that Jesus was standing in the middle. And as the, as the people came toward him, he would say, left, 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 right, left. Almost everybody was going to the left. And I realized judgment day had come. Just like Matthew 25, 31 and on, when you read about the separating the sheep and the goats. And he said, oh Lord, I've been an Adventist all my life. I've been in the church all my life. I've carried responsibilities. Oh, I hope he says right. But when he got closer, Jesus looked at him sadly and said, left. What could it be? I've lost my eternal life. What what did I do? And while he was thinking his thoughts, an angel touched him and said, you were almost saved. What does almost saved mean? Why? Why was I almost saved? What, what, what made me to lose eternal life? And the angel touched him again and said, because you ignored the small details. And he started thinking, small details like the way I keep Sabbath. Small details like the music I listen to. Surely God doesn't mind if I watch a movie now and then. Surely I can, I can do this. Surely, I can. Surely God won't. It's something very small. And he started seeing all those little small details in his life that he thought were not of consequence. And he came to the realization, God is a God of small details. He said, oh, Lord, if only, if only I could have another chance to correct those details. And the angel touched him on his shoulder and said, God has heard your prayer. You will have another chance. And he woke up. Ah, such relief. He promptly cleaned up. His Lord, he knelt down. He gave his heart to the Lord. Clean, clean my life. Out with the music. Out with that. Those, everything, that entertainment. I want to put those small details in order. And he put all those details in order. And he said, oh, Lord, thank you very much. And then he said, my wife now wants to tell her testimony. And she got up and she said, two weeks ago, an angel appeared to me also in a vision. And she said, we told your husband to fix the small details. But there's one small detail he has not fixed. She said, what is it? Tell me what it is and we'll fix it. You're still living in the cities. And you know better than that. Follow God's counsel and move out into the country 
That's a small detail that you have to fix immediately. They were able to sell their home in just a few weeks. Not everybody can do that, but God has a plan for everybody. We know that if you pray and surrender everything to the Lord and ask him, he will show you the way. But they sold their house and they're living out in the country. They still work in the city. They still work with the people there, but they're following the instructions to live on the outside. I just, I just spoke that in Amsterdam. <laughs> How many people live in a city in Amsterdam? I just spoke it in Lima, Peru. 12 million people live in Lima, Peru. Brothers and sisters, this is not a game. God is revealing things to his children and letting them tell their testimony so that all of us can understand God is a God of small details. Put your life in order. Prepare, O Israel, to meet your God. And follow his advice. He's given us the advice. Why should we be rebellious? Why will you perish, O Israel? Why would you die? Well, in 2015, early 2015, somebody called me up and said, Uncle David, I have a message for you from God. And I, went, mm. I had somebody call me and tell me that one time too, and, and the message was not from God. You have more power on you than you think. You can destroy your enemies with one word. Just like Elijah. Boom, say the word and they will be burned up. I go, what? You can do that. You have internal power. I said, I said, sister, if I believed you, I would lose my whole entire connection with God. Because if I believe I have power in God, Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. Jesus did not come to destroy. How can I come to do that? If God wants to do, pour out judgment, let him pour out his judgment. But don't make me believe that I can do this on my own and that this is the whole spirit that's foreign to God. God eventually pours out his judgments, but that's his decision. And I said, I'm sorry, I reject that message. I cannot accept it. So when this person calls and tells me I got a message from God, I go, we'll see. Now you tell me if it was or not. Here's the message. God said, please tell David that I have a lot to teach him still, but he, I need more time with him. He's too busy. You think that's a message of God? Is that your message for you too? It's a message for all of us, isn't it? I said, thank you. So I knelt down and I said, Lord, man, I've given birth to projects in 94 countries. If a mother has about 20 children, that mother hardly has time to sleep. And I got children all over the world and projects, they call me, and I'm doing it to advance your work, and I know it keeps me busy, and I don't want to miss that. But how can I tell one of my project directors, I don't have time for you anymore. I know you're suffering. I know you need advice. I know you need help. Leave me alone. How can I do that? So Lord, please just forgive me. But somehow, in my busy schedule, even though we spend time together each morning, I don't have too much quiet time the rest of the day. But please, please just forgive me and teach me. Crack my head, whatever you have to do. We all have hard heads, right? It's hard for God to get in here. We need silence, and I don't have too much silence. But please, Lord, please, I'm, I humble myself before you. And then a bunch of things begin to happen which I did not recognize as having anything to do with it. But then, as I started connecting all the pieces, I began to realize I'm beginning to understand some things. For, at first, a little bit nebulous, and then a little bit more in focus, and a little bit more, a little bit here, a little bit there, experiences, testimonies, A physician friend of mine from Walla Walla wrote on April 30. And he said, I had a dream last night, a very vivid dream. I just want to share it with you. I don't know what it means. But in this dream, I was told, in yet five months, and I will judge the tribe of Levi. I don't know what it means. But it must have something to do with judgment, and it must have something to do with the church. Because we are the tribe of Levi. We are those set aside to deal with the things of the sanctuary. Yes or no? 
We're the only ones that understand the sanctuary. Actually, we think we are. Did you know that other evangelicals, I heard a, a Baptist pastor give a presentation on the sanctuary, and I thought it was an Adventist presentation because God's not keeping this message only to himself. If we're not going to share it, he's sharing it with other people who will share it. If Adventist pastors won't share it, Baptist pastors will. We're going to lose our crown. I'll tell you what, if you don't hang on to what you have, you're going to lose your crown. That's why to Philadelphia, God says, hang on to that which thou hast, that nobody take your crown. Hang on to what you believe. Don't let them steal your crown. But what does it mean in yet five months? He said, I've added up biblically five months and it takes me to the last part of September. September 23. What's going to happen September 23? I don't know. But that's, that's what it comes to. Well, I said, interesting, and went on my way. A little piece of information. And then I recorded a message when the Pope finally came on September 23 to the States. I recorded a message saying something is happening. If things are advancing, do you believe that the Pope's arrival to North America and his possession of the Congress and the White House, do you think it represents a, a fulfillment of prophecy? Are you sure? I am too. It's being fulfilled before our very eyes. And yet, when did we read about it in any official magazine? In South American Division, the pastors received a video. Do not speak about the Pope's arrival. This has nothing to do with prophecy. The whole division received the same instruction. Today, Adventist pastors are being controlled about what they can preach. And if you, if you care about your job, you just obey. But if you care what God tells you to do, you won't have a job very long. So my advice is, cast your situation in God's hands and go forward, launch into the warfare. If you don't have a job, congratulations for you. Now you're freer to preach. <laughs> or keep your job and go to hell. But you report to God first, not to man. And pastors that report to man first will find they have lost their salvation because God will then raise other messengers to do their job, but they will have lost their crown. My dear fellow pastors, wherever you are, if you hear this, go to God and beg his forgiveness and place yourself in his hands and say, anything you tell me to do, I want to be your ambassador because you're, if you're an ambassador for man, you're no ambassador for God. Let's get this clear now. The king calls you to be an ambassador and you must speak his words faithfully. If you're not, you're no ambassador. Your credentials will be removed and you will be cast out into outer darkness. Let's get it straight from now on. Every one of us are to be faithful ambassadors. Tell it the way it is. So I said, if things are happening on earth, things are happening in heaven as well. Things are moving forward on earth, things are moving forward in heaven. God is drawing things to an end. He's recognized, we are, we're in a shaking time right now. We are in a shaking time. Every single person, every single administrator, every single pastor is having to choose sides. Don't just think, poor me, I'm under pressure. Everybody's under pressure. The GC president's under pressure. His life was threatened after he preached his sermon in 2010 after Pastor Wilson was inaugurated. His life was threatened for preaching that sermon. He's under pressure. He has to choose sides. The divisions have to choose sides. The unions have to choose sides. The fields have to choose sides. Every member has to choose sides. So don't feel sorry for yourself. Choose sides. <laughs> choose ye this day whom ye will serve. You can't be in the middle anymore. Christian service says God is looking for, for men that will stand, and women, of course, that will stand forward and will demand that you identify yourself not only to identify yourself, but to come forward and prove that you are a servant of kings of loyal to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Prove it. Are you an Adventist or not? Don't just sit there. Prove it. The universe is looking. 
People are waiting. Are you an ambassador? Then come forward and say, I'm an ambassador, and I report to God. Because if you report to man, stay in the back or get out of the church. Or God will spew you out. God would rather you are cold than lukewarm. Declare your coldness and leave. I don't know why people who do not want to believe in the Adventist message, why do they stay inside? Don't you know what's coming to those people? It's much better to leave than to be vomited out. God said that whether you were cold or hot, but not lukewarm, because I will have to vomit you out of my mouth. So something is going forward, and we're making choices, and our decisions that we make today are determining our eternal destiny. Someday soon that will be recorded forever with no changes. But you know the decisions we make? When Jesus was on earth preaching, he was very tender with the Pharisees at the beginning. And as they dug their heels in, as they began to become more rebellious, as they planned his death, he became more clear and more clear until finally he said, you are of your father the devil, and the will of your father you will do. You say, but, is, but, but the time of probation hadn't finished for Israel yet. Jesus recognized they had made their decision. He would have never said that. But he was praying that they would change their minds. But they didn't. The time of probation ended on Sunday afternoon after the triumphal entry. As the sun was beginning to set, the last hours of probation were still open. But the sun set and the destiny was sealed. He still gave them three and a half more years to let people individually make decisions. God is merciful. But eventually the door closes. And some people make their permanent decisions even before the door closes. God recognizes the decisions. On July 2015, at one of the favorite events that I ever go to in the world, it's called the General Conference Session, all your friends from around the world, any place you used to work, all of those uh, colleagues that you have served with, you can see them and talk to them. It's a wonderful time. I've never missed one since 1980. 80, 85, 90, 95, 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015. Everyone, I haven't missed one. 2015 had a lot of interesting, but it was one of my favorite general conferences. There was a lot of prayer. Every time things would get heated, you know, women's ordination was the big thing. That whole world was focused on the issue of women's ordination. Every time things got heated, the chairman would say, let us stop and pray, brethren, and you could feel the temperature drop. We've never prayed so many times that I remember as 2015. I appreciate that they call for prayer. But as is frequently or almost always the case, when the big issues are decided, nobody's watching anymore. What happened on Thursday and Friday, many of the delegates, especially those from Africa, South America, they want to go shopping. They weren't sent to the States to go shopping. But they figure, there's four or 5,000 of us. I don't know. I don't remember the number of delegates. There's thousands of us. Nobody will know if I'm missing. I'm going to go take advantage this afternoon to go do something. And everybody knows what happens. The seats are empty everywhere. The big issue has been decided. The world voted on the no. The world church voted no to women's ordination. Four divisions said, we don't care what the world church says. We will do what we want to. Open rebellion in the ranks. Sometimes they call speakers dissidents. Excuse me, the dissidents are those four divisions. The world church spoke, and the divisions say, we don't care what the world church says. We want to be separate. The North American division, 
trans-European, inter-European, and South Pacific division. We will continue doing what we want to do, and we really don't care. In fact, it's gotten worse. The South Pacific division has already made move, has already requested, and they're working on a request to totally legal, legally separate from the World Church. So what happens if you're a member of the South Pacific Division and you're not a member of the World Seventh-day Adventist Church anymore? They will change their legal name. They will be legally separate, but we will still work together. It's like, let's get a divorce, but we'll still be friends. Excuse me. The pillars are falling apart. The structure, we, we knew it when we pulled a, a, the middle pillar of the sanctuary out. The roof collapses. Well, you pull four divisions out, and they start going their own way. My own... No, I won't. That's too intimate. I was going to tell you something, but one, one union here in North America years ago voted that in union in session that they were no longer going to be responsible to the general conference. Immediately their credentials should have been removed. The entire membership should have been disfellowshipped and the, all the assets taken and everybody fired. What happened? Nothing. Now a division wants to do the same thing. Nothing. In fact, they're already ready. Most of the assets in some conferences here in the United States have already transferred all of the church properties outside of the conference. So if, the, if for some reason they're disciplined, they'll say, you can keep your piece of paper. We own all the properties anyway. You don't discipline the son? Eli did not discipline his sons. And God punished Eli because he was unable to discipline inappropriate behavior. And we have been unable to discipline rogue behavior and rebellious behavior within our own ranks. And the more you let it get away with, the more rebellious they get. Well, guess what? In the afternoon, when nobody was present except a few delegates, a very, 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 the most important things that could have come up, came up. It was suggested that we make a lot of changes, some of the changes in our church manual, some of the changes in our basic fundamental beliefs. Some well-known pastors stood up and said, please, do not make those changes. Remove those suggested changes from the list. That would, that would change the whole direction that we're going. It will make us different than we've been for 150 years. It will change the whole Advent message and who we are. Our identity will be changed. Please take it off. And the chairman was very fair. The chairman said, we have a motion. How many delegates would like to take off those proposed changes? All those in favor? All those against? Okay, it is rejected. The two changes will remain. The World Church voted clearly, knowing what they were doing, they voted to make the changes. And the changes are these. All you have to do is pull out a book on fundamental beliefs before 2015 and a current one or go to the GC website and you can read what we believe and those changes have been made. We no longer believe in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ. 150 plus years this has been our driving. Why do you think we have the name Adventist? We were born in the Advent message. It's the it's the midnight cry. The bridegroom is coming. Let us go forth to meet him. And because that, of that midnight cry, it's supposed to shine the whole length of the path. And those who deny the light will eventually fall off the path. Sadly enough, while we were carelessly shopping, a small group of people, representative of the whole world church, voted that we no longer believe in the imminent coming. It's just the soon coming, which could be many, many years. 
You say, it's the same thing. Oh, it is? Then leave it alone. Why do you have to take it out if it's the same thing? Because it isn't the same thing. Eminent means it's at the doors. But we Adventists don't believe that any longer. Most pastors do not believe that any longer. Most theology professors do not believe that any longer. Most divisions and official theologians do not support that any longer. And as we discovered, most of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church does not believe it any longer. So we made the official change. One other change was made. The spirit of prophecy before stated we believed that the spirit of prophecy was a continuing source of light and truth that has been removed. If, you re if it's not a source of light and truth, it is just inspirational literature. How can you preach the spirit of prophecy if it's not a source of light and truth? Why would you quote the spirit of prophecy from the pulpit unless there's light? But we have rejected the prophets. Therefore, we cannot prosper. Believe his prophets, said good King Jehoshaphat, and so shall you prosper. Just a few weeks ago, somebody sent me the testimony of a lady, 80-year-old lady in Colombia, a mother in the church. On July 2015, she woke up one night and she was asked in her dream or vision, what do you hear? She said, I hear a clock. Tick, 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 tick. Listen carefully. What do you hear now? It's getting louder. Tick, 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 tick. What do you hear now? The clock has stopped. I don't hear the clock anymore. And the messenger said, tell my people the clock has stopped. Repeated it three times. Tell my people the clock has stopped. Tell my people the clock has stopped. Brothers and sisters, that's only a testimony from one person. But God recognizes the decisions of nations. God recognizes the decisions of organization. We as an Advent people believing and teaching in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ, believing that the spirit of prophecy is a sign of God's last remnant people, have rejected the imminent coming of Jesus Christ, and we no longer have the sign of the spirit of prophecy. What does it mean when the clock has stopped? I don't know. But it makes me tremble inside. It makes me realize more than ever before, God recognizes our decisions. We ourselves can close the door to God's mercy by making official decisions. What is in store for the Advent people? How much time do we have? This is an urgent message. I just have to share with you. This made me tremble inside and it, it made me make some changes in my life. Because if the clock has stopped, it could mean that sooner than I think, my name will come up. God says, I recognize your position. You have made a decision worldwide. It was not forced on you. You, as a remnant people of God, made the decision to reject the light and truth of the spirit of prophecy officially and in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ, which means we're no longer Adventists. Is the Seventh Adventist Church God's church? Yes. Am I going to leave? No. There's nowhere to go. This is it. This is God's people. I will love the Advent message, but not everybody who says they're an Adventist is really an Adventist. We heard that only a very small percent, maybe 1%, will be ready. Well, on October 22, there was 50,000 Adventists. On October 23, there was only 50. 
Only one in a thousand remained. And what's to say that we're any better? Brothers and sisters, we live in the most solemn time of Earth's history. God is recognizing the decisions we make individually, as a family, as a congregation, as an institution. And my knees tremble. Sister White cried when she saw the condition and the things that were going to happen. The rejection. One thing is certain, she said. Those that reject the testimonies will march under Satan's banner. Why? Because they have no defense. Because they have no way to defend themselves against the astute deceptions of Satan. The spirit of prophecy was given to us to defend us, to protect us, and to teach us our mission and to point the light so we could carry out our mission in this last generation. If you reject that light, you have no protection left. No armor left. Oh, what must God feel like? All the world churches gathered together. We focus on women's ordination. And as soon as that happens, poof, the limelight is taken away. And major decisions that upheavals turn the Adventist church upside down happened in just a few minutes. And they are registered by heaven as permanent decisions. I would like to ask you now, given the fact that many around us have turned cold, given the fact that many of around us have rejected light and truth, given the fact that time is almost finished, and given the fact that God is looking for a people, a remnant within the remnant, that are willing to be faithful to our standard, beautiful messages that came out of the loud cry, out of the, out of the midnight cry, and that it will illuminate our path all the way to Jesus' coming. Those that are willing to preach truth, though the heavens fall, that are willing to bear the ambassadorship, be it unpopular, even if it costs us our life, even if people throw rocks at you, like my division president said in Inter-America, don't worry, David. Only trees that have fruits on them get stones thrown at them. You can see little kids throwing stones at the ripe mango, the one ripe mango on top of the tree. If you bear fruit, there will be stones thrown at you. This is normal. It only happens if you bear fruit. If you don't like stones, stop bearing fruit. But I plant trees all over, and I got, I got 10 types of mangoes behind my house in Bolivia. I brought them in from the Caribbean. I got Julie mangoes, spice mangoes, apple mangoes, papaya mangoes. I got all kinds of stuff. And as they bear fruit in the first time, they come, I go, ah. Oh. And the Lord said, you like fruit on your trees? I like fruit on my people. What have I done? What else could I do for my people so that they will bear fruit for my vineyard? If you want to be, if you today, you want to say, Lord, I want to be your ambassador. I want to be faithful to the message, regardless of the consequences. But Lord, please prepare me to stand in that great day. If that's your desire, I'm going to ask you to come forward today. I was going to preach a sermon tomorrow, but God said, preach it today. It doesn't take many people to finish the work. In Jesus' time, 12. 12 made, were disciples. 120 were anointed by the Holy Spirit. And the message exploded across Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. We're hundreds here today. If the Holy Spirit will be poured out on us, can you imagine? This would change the entire world. And God could use us to bring in our families and our loved ones. Noah was found faithful. And God saved his family. Lot was found unfaithful. And he lost his family. God saved him, but he lost his family. We want to be found faithful so that God can contend with them that contend with you. And I will save your children. If you've come forward and made this decision, praise the Lord. 
I would like to invite you, if possible, to kneel with me. If not, you, are, you may remain standing. Heavenly Father, we believe that you have poured out your spirit on Sister Ellen White. And through her, you have added more light to that which we already have in order to protect us, to direct us to the last generation. As we understand and grow and read, you're able to teach us and to guide us with your eyes and to speak to us and say, this is the way. Go left, go right. But Lord, we have to read. We have to hear. But here we are. We came to hear. We came to read. We came to learn. And you have poured out your spirit. But Lord, occasionally you remind us through other servants. You remind us that you recognize the decisions of institutions. They become official decisions registered in heaven. And you recognize our decisions. What side we're on. Are we going to compromise and just fit in for the sake of peace? Or are we going to side with you and allow, you, allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse us of all unrighteousness? Are we going to believe that we can sin until Jesus comes? Or are we going to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work and Jesus as our high priest to cleanse us of all unrighteousness? The promise is if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. We are reconciled with God through the death of his son. But even so, being reconciled, we are saved through his life. We need both, his death and his life. So as your ambassadors, we want to be covered with your white robe of righteousness. Our works are filthy rags. But your robe of righteousness can cover all of that. And it's free. Take away, like the high priest, Joshua the high priest, take away our filthy garments and give us new white raiment that we may stand in the day of judgment and that we may be used by you to save our children, that we may be used by you to save our loved ones. Oh, Lord, we will not let go of that promise. You promised to save our children. Anoint them with your Holy Spirit and save them. Can the, can the, can the captive or the mighty be taken away? But I say they can, says the Lord of hosts. And I will take away the mighty, the captive from the mighty, and I will contend with him that contends with you, and I will save your children. That's your promise. We will not let thee go except thou bless us. Yes. Give us his blessing as we enter the sacred Sabbath hours. We enter with your presence. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen.